All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to this uh, Q&A with Stephen Grossberg. We're here to discuss his pioneering theoretical work on mind and brain, which he's collected in a, in a new book called Conscious Mind, Resonant Brain. Steve Grossberg is one of the um, is the Wang Professor of Cognitive and Neural Systems. He's Professor Emeritus uh, of Mathematics and Statistics, and also in the Psychological and Brain Sciences and Biomedical Engineering at BU. He's the founder of the Neural Networks Journal and was the founder of the Department of Cognitive Systems, which leads to me. I'm Johan John. I'm a research assistant professor at BU um, uh, in the Neural Systems Lab under Helen Barbus. Um, I did my PhD at the Department of Cognitive and Neural Systems, CNS, uh, under Dan Bullock. So when I heard uh, through a podcast, actually, that Steve's uh, long-awaited book, was coming out, uh, I emailed uh, some fellow CNS grads and said, we have to read this. Um, so after the past few months, so over the past few months, we've been going through it chapter by chapter. Uh, and uh, for those who would like an in-depth uh, discussion, I've been uploading these to YouTube. So uh, thanks very much, Steve, for joining us. This should be an exciting session. Uh, I'm aiming for, I guess, two hours. If we, if we go over, that'll be OK. Steve has time, and so do I. Um, so. The plan for today uh, is uh, we're going to organize this in three parts. It's just questions, but I think some structure will help a lot. So, um, so, so you can write down questions if you like based on and ask them depending on when you think they'll fit with these three parts. First, we'll talk about the current state of computational neuroscience, what Steve thinks about that, uh, about the past of the field, his past in the field, and where he sees the field going. Um, second, we'll get into some specific and technical questions about adaptive resonance theory and all the other um, theoretical work Steve's done. Since we have, we've been going through it, we have, you know, particular questions. Um, uh, and then the third part will be the sort of big questions uh, um, opportunity. We'll talk about higher cognition, language, the C word, consciousness, which once upon a time neuroscience didn't, scientists didn't like to talk about, but now they love to apparently, uh, and even society art as in painting and music potentially, and um, well-being and uh, self-improvement, which is also very popular in the neural world these days. So I'm thinking half an hour to 45 minutes for, for each session. Um, since we've collected questions, I'll start with a few of those. And, and if we're running out of time, then I'll, I'll open up so that there's plenty of time for participants to also ask questions. Um, make sure their questions are actually questions and not comments and uh, try not to ask two questions at once. Just ask one question and I'll let you ask a follow up. Uh, no problem. Uh, you, there's a raise hands um, option in Zoom that you can use in case we don't um, see you waving, <laughs> uh, but preferably use the, the raise hands button. And I'll request you to un unmute and then you can ask your question. Or if you prefer, you can type it in there and uh, I can ask it on your behalf. So with that, let me spotlight Steve. Um, and um, welcome, Steve, and let me uh, get started on my questions. All right, um, so, so for a layperson uh, who doesn't really know about your work, even though arguably you, you may be one of the most well-known neuroscientists within the field, um, uh, for someone who doesn't know about your work, uh, how would you describe uh, your goals and assumptions and what your research project is? Well, all of my work tries to explain how brain mechanisms control psychological functions. And that's because brain evolution needs to achieve behavioral success, which is just another way of saying that Darwinian selection operates during evolution on our behavior to shape the design of our brains. And so that's why my book has its title, Conscious Mind Resonant Brain, How Each Brain Makes a Mind. They always go hand in hand in my thinking, but to make the linkage, interactions within and across several brain regions are often needed to generate psychological behaviors. And moreover, these behaviors are emergent properties of the brain interactions. So purely experimental approaches can't fully understand or 
record emergent properties. And for that, you really need models. And to derive the models, I developed a modeling method and a cycle. Uh, so because brain evolution needs to achieve behavioral success, the modeling method naturally always starts by analyzing scores or even hundreds of psychological experiments because these are the experiments that describe properties of the behavior that's being shaped by evolution. And the method first has to have a, a creative leap because psychological data are just static curves on paper. And to really understand brain, you have to see behind the data to see it uh, how those curves emerged from the real time uh, behavior of individual brains. And so the method shows how to discover design principles that underlie these large psychological databases and then how to convert them into minimal models. So there's a kind of Occam's razor here that embody them, and then how to use the models to explain a lot more psychological data than was used to derive them, because otherwise your theory is just uh, useless. And for me, the most delightful surprise was that the models also explained and predicted lots of neural data. And indeed, the models look like parts of a living brain and that's why they are biological neural network models. I never try to derive neural networks. They just came out of a psychological analysis. But you're never done in this business because no one derivation can derive a whole brain. And so after doing such a derivation, um, I would analyze it to see its explanatory limits. It helped me to see what I like to call the boundary between the known and the unknown. And seeing the shape of that boundary always suggested to me new hypotheses that led to a model that can explain and predict even more data. And the new model always included the old model. So it's a kind of unlumping process, albeit in a more sophisticated form. So for one example, when I began to understand how we learn how to attend, recognize, and predict objects and events in a changing world, I eventually, that led me to a functional understanding of how and why the layers of the cerebral cortex exist and interact the way they do. What is the functional role of layers? So that takes a long time to make a leap like that. So to end this part of the discussion, I developed a modeling cycle that leads to increasingly realistic models with ever greater explanatory power I've gone through the cycle lots of times with gifted collaborators since I began working 64 years ago. And I assume many others will continue this unlumping process long after I'm gone. But if you want a picture of the modeling method and cycle, look at figure 237 in my book. It's in chapter two and it's figure 37. So. Anyway, I thanks. That thanks. Um, so, in fact, I, that might be a good opportunity to um, seg into uh, a, a quick question because you mentioned emergence, and it's a kind of a popular topic nowadays um, uh, outside of even neuroscience in philosophy and in many places. So, uh, there's this loose idea of the whole being greater than the sum of the parts. So, so how would you define emergence, and if you have this intuition about emergent properties. How, where does that come from? <laughs> that isn't one of the questions in your list. I had an opportunity. First, I would have to tell you more about 
how intuition plays a role in developing the model. But an emergent property is just the property that comes out of nonlinear interactions across very large networks of neurons. As von Neumann said, he expected brains would be defined by very simple operations. And that insight led him to design the von Neumann computer, just zeros and ones could, you know, give you any computable quantity based on the classical work of Alan Turing. Um, and a similar thing happens in the brain. You know, the dynamics of individual cells, albeit they can be very complex, do not in themselves express properties of behavior. So they're just the properties that emerge from interactions of neurons in order to map directly onto behavioral acts or to control behavioral acts. I was hoping so, you would ask me. Oh, I'm moving I, to the, I'm moving, uh, I might insert some things depending okay. on what you say. So, yeah, did that but, help? was that helpful? Yes, yes, that was perfect. Um, um, so what do you think um, constitutes a successful scientific theory? Um, which theories and models uh, in biology other than, than your own conform best to your ideals? Well, that's why I structured my answer the way I did, because as I just noted, a good theory should be able to explain and predict a lot more data than went into the hypothesis that you used to derive it but it should also be principle. It should be able to give you a principled unified explanation of large databases that reorganizes the functional meaning of the data. As to great examples, you know, we all know Darwin's theory of natural selection is perhaps the most successful theory in biology. It absolutely transformed society. And on a somewhat narrower scale, I think, the Hodgkin-Huxley equations for nerve impulse uh, propagation are another wonderful example, even though they were just talking about the squid giant axon because it was big enough in order to do the recordings. The um, design principles that can be generalized from that equation and which Gail Carpenter is one of the leading people to have done, then allow you to explain tons of uh, cellular data in a more unified way, not just the squid giant axon. Okay. So uh, with these kinds of principles, what kind of advice would you give to, to students entering the field? Uh, what is the Grossbergian way to think about a problem, to approach some, a new problem? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dignify what I'm about to say with being Grossbergian or whatever, but I think first a student really has to devote themselves to studying the theoretical literature. Um, and I don't mean just for the last five years. Theories that are any good last much longer. Just think about our greatest examples of Newton and Einstein. So any such student has to be willing to do real scholarly work and go back as far as they can. And in the world of Google, we can do that. There's no excuse. You don't have to own all the books, just do a Google search. Um, and second, if you wanna be a biological modeler, I, I always think it's important to find data whose meaning you're dying to understand because you have to be willing to put in the hard work that's gonna be needed to understand it. So for myself, I often thought about data I was dying, dying to understand often for years before I had a theoretical concepts and tools that could explain them in a quantitative and principled way. So as to a Grossbergian way to think about the problem, my earlier comments are relevant. Most importantly, try to understand the design principles that can unify the data. 
But in my own life, when I understood the data well enough, I was able to use a thought experiment to derive a model from first principles. And by that, I mean that the hypotheses that drive the thought experiment are typically just a few facts that we all know. They're not erudite. And we all know them because it's the conjoint action of those facts as persistent environmental pressures that drive the evolution of our brains. And so the power of a thought experiment is if you believe these facts that we all know and you follow a logical derivation of a model, there's no escape, okay? So, for example, in my 1980 article in Psychological Review, which was then the leading uh, theory journal in psychology and is one of the leading journals today, I derived what I called adaptive resonance theory from a thought experiment about how any system can autonomously correct predictive errors in a changing world. And critically, nowhere during the thought experiment were the words mind or brain mentioned so that these adaptive resonance theory or art principles and mechanisms I would contend are a universal solution to this learning problem, which I call the stability plasticity dilemma for reasons I'll explain in a little while. And the same is true for my model of cognitive emotional interactions or how thinking and feeling interact together to acquire valued goals. Here, I derived that model again after years of studying data that enabled me to construct it in the first place and explain the data. Uh, I was able to derive it from a thought experiment that never mentions the word mind and brain. And because of this universality, I think the models can be used. And some people have used them in a, at least partially, as a blueprint for applications to autonomous adaptive intelligence in engineering technology and AI. And there's quite a long list of applications, but the funding, the sustained funding to actually create general purpose autonomous, adaptively intelligent algorithms and adaptive mobile robots haven't been there. A lot of funding has been time limited uh, at best. Um, anyway, so. So stepping back to the kind of the birth of, of the, this approach and these ideas, um, who were your biggest influences starting? You probably started thinking about this in the late 50s, right? So what were the kind of pieces uh, in the, that sort of synergized in your mind? Well, I always started with data that I fell in love with. And I could tell you the leading experimentalists who discovered and developed the data, but they're different people in very different parts of psychology and neuroscience. So for example, if you read my book, I celebrate these people at every chance I get. You know, I, I felt honored and privileged to be able to add on to their foundational discoveries. But it's always starting with the data and what made them great was their intuition into what data were important and where relevant their ability to construct apparatus to collect it in a statistically reliable way. So um, in terms of the current, the current um, crop of computational neuroscientists, theoretical neuroscientists, uh, who else uh, do you kind of uh, keep out an eye out for in terms of their ideas and for students, who, who else would you point them to? Well, um, the best ones in my mind, or at least the ones I know of, 
are first and foremost, usually wonderful experimentalists. Uh, let me just read what I wrote down so I don't forget some of them. Uh, they include Wolf Singer, Yuri Buzaki, Rich Schifrin, Lynn Nadell, Dan Schachter, Mike Gazaniga, Bruce McNaughton, Wolfram Schultz, V.S. Ramachandran, Mike Haslamo, Steve Coslin, and so on. But I have to add that none of these people was trained as a theorist. Uh, they have wonderful experimental intuition, but it's limited by the fact that they don't have theoretical tools to probe into underlying design. So um, they never really, to the best of my knowledge, develop principled neural theories with a broad predictive range. Rather, they would try to provide theoretical uh, explanations of really the paradigm they were working in. Um, and if I may add, the sad fact is there are hardly any, if any, graduate programs that I think of that currently provide systematic, truly theoretical training to PhD students and postdocs. Even now, most theoretical training, as I just mentioned, works to explain data from the labs of a PhD mentor. There's nothing wrong with that, but you know, it's just like a lot of monads. There's no, no uh, cross talk. And so that's why I was proud that our Department of Cognitive and Neural Systems at BU was devoted to doing this. And, and our faculty introduced 18 new uh, interdisciplinary courses that individually taught psychological data, neurobiological data, theoretical models, mathematical methods, and in a number of cases, applications to engineering uh, and technology and AI. And sadly, after I stepped down as chairman, Boston University decided to shut us down at the height of our department's fame funding and training of gifted PhDs and postdocs. That was a terrible decision by what I'd have to say was an incompetent dean who lasted a very short time in her position because we weren't the only victims of her incompetence. But, you know, this is just an example of lots of bad things but done quickly in history by leaders who don't last long. But the shutting down of CNS was a minor tragedy compared to what we confront every day. So, um, in fact, I, I, I'd, I'd appreciate, in fact, I, more and more as the years went on that the CNS coursework was so interdisciplinary so that you got a sampling of different you know, types of ways of thinking about the brain, different modalities, motor control, hearing, memory, and also machine learning. So a lot of neuroscientists don't learn that much about machine learning. And, and on the other side, a lot of machine learning theorists don't know that much about the brain. So with that in mind, what do you think about the current state of um, AI? There's a whole lot of hype, particularly about deep learning and things like that. So, so but art has actually been used in, in machine learning con uh, context. So what, where do, what do you think of the state of the field now and where do you think it ought to go? Well, <clears throat> if you want to be inspired in AI by how brains work, which is what everyone says, whatever the hell they really do, uh, then you should do what I've recommended students should do to work in biological neural network models. You should read the broader modeling literature so you have a good foundation to launch your own contributions. But it's very sad in contrast to see how narrow the training of so many people in AI is now. In particular, the deep learning fad that has swept AI seems to have convinced lots of people that deep learning is all you need to do 
to do serious AI and to build a career in it. But I'm old enough to have seen a lot of fads come and go. Uh, so in particular, how many of you ever heard of the catastrophe theory of René Thom? Well, you know, your scholars. Uh, that was supposed to save all of computational science in the 1960s and 70s, but it crashed and burned because most of the phenomena they try to explain didn't obey the axioms of elementary catastrophes. That was the heart of the theory. Um, as to deep learning, if it's used in applications, then at least it should be benchmarked against all the other models that have successfully developed the application. If it does better, that's wonderful. But if it's just an existence proof, oh, we recognize some cats. Well, what model doesn't recognize cats? Um, more than that, you may know already that back propagation is the learning algorithm of deep learning. And it's been known since no later than 1988 that back propagation is untrustworthy. In the strict sense, it's not explainable. And it's unreliable in the strict sense is it can experience catastrophic forgetting. So it should never be used in any application with life or death consequences like a medical or financial application. Cause if you make a bad prediction that you know really harms someone, they'll sue you for everything you're worth because then all they have to do is find someone who can, you know, remind them that it's untrustworthy and unreliable. In any case, my 1988 article in the first issue of Neural Networks listed 17 fundamental computational problems of backpropagation, including the unreliability and untrustworthiness, and showed that adaptive resonance didn't have those problems. So deep learning inherited all those problems and I still haven't seen any correction of them. Although I've seen epicycles that I talk about in a paper I published last year on explainable AI that didn't really solve the problem. They just made it worse. And the people who market it like uh, Jeffrey Hinton, I haven't ever personally heard him say, Use it with caution, <laughs> but maybe he has more power to him. So getting back to um, well, neuroscience mainly, um, when you survey the field now, where do you think your ideas have had the, the most sort of take up? Where, how, where do you uh, see that your ideas really have had some influence? Uh, because a lot of people will, you know, the joke is that biologists are a little bit afraid of differential equations, which is less so now, but, but so where do you think the take up has been most successful? Well, <clears throat> I think what others think of my influence in a sense defines my influence. I can flap my lips from here to eternity, but that won't matter if no one thinks it's influenced them. And, Therefore, I'd like to recommend, if you haven't already, read the pre-publication reviews by 22 of the most famous psychologists, neuroscientists, and technologists in the world about my book and my work. Um, they make me blush, but all those people have been deeply influenced by my work, and they're in multiple different fields. Uh, I should, however, add some more specifics that between 1967 and 1972, in a series of articles in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which is about as mainstream as you could get, I introduced the paradigm of using systems of nonlinear differential equations to model how brains give rise to minds. And I also, at the same time, in those papers, introduced the foundational equations 
for neuronal activation or short-term memory, activity dependent habituation or medium-term memory, or learning and memory or long-term memory that are at the foundation of all biological models of how brains make minds to this day. Um, and then I use the foundation to introduce and develop again with many gifted collaborators over the next 60 some odd years, neural models who I think one could say fairly include essentially all the most important processes of human intelligence, at least their foundations, notably how, where in our brains and why from an evolutionary perspective, our brains can consciously see, hear, feel, and know things about the world and how conscious states can be used to control planning and effective action in the world. And, and, and to brag a little, uh, I was sort of stunned when it happened. Uh, John Silber, who was president of Boston University when he introduced me to give the university annual lecture in 1989 to a general audience from all over Boston, called me the Newton and Einstein of the mind because I'd introduced these foundations and gone on uh, to explain in a principled and unified way already by 1989, a ton of data, remember that adaptive resonance theory, the foundations anyway, were introduced between 1976 and 1980, even though it's still a theory that's being incrementally developed to the present time and will continue to be so for years to come. So um, in terms of the sort of big scope of, of, of your style of modeling, uh, you could say that uh, at first glance, there's a kind of uh, rationalist bias, meaning that you kind of treat uh, certain problems uh, in a very sort of spherical cow kind of way, like a very top-down kind of perspective. And a lot of biologists like to kind of uh, look at things with a great deal of detail. So in this sort of spectrum from rationalism to em empiricism, where would you situate yourself uh, in, in, in that tradition, in those sort of two traditions? Well, I did write a brief answer to that, but your question out of order, so I'll just say it off the top of my head. Uh, the empiricism tradition, uh, I, I totally celebrate because my main gift is to see to the heart of data. And so I always start it with morasses of data, uh, which is what empiricists do. As to the rationalist tradition, my goal is to provide principled unifying theories that are rigorous and can't get more rationalist than that in science. So my work tries to unify them through a process that I just sketched in terms of my theoretical method and cycle, starting with data, hundreds of parametric experiments and deriving from it increasingly uh, explanatory and predictive principle theories. I just had, there was a question from, in fact, one of the CNS students that I thought I could uh, add here. It's not on that list, but but um, he, he wrote, I was surprised uh, to note that uh, Giancarlo Rota was your advisor uh, and he worked in combinatorics. Um, so was uh, how did you get him as an advisor and in what way uh, did any of that uh, influence your work? This kind of now we're moving into the more specific stuff. But, um, well, I first met Giancarlo when I became a graduate student at the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research, which had, was just becoming the Rockefeller University. And it decided to admit a small number of students 
not that long before I became a student there. Of course, for many years, the Rockefeller Institute produced many of the most famous Nobel laureates in medicine, and they wanted to have lab slaves. And so they let in some kids to be their lab slaves. But because there was also an emerging mathematics and physics program, I was glad to go there because I'd already taken 90 degrees of graduate credits in mathematics and related areas when I was at Stanford, where I had been for three years. And I was very unhappy there because everyone there wanted to know, well, why don't you want to work in fluid dynamics? Why does a smart boy like you want to understand how the brain works? Anyway, Rockefeller had this great tradition of brain science, in addition to, you know, all the molecular stuff. And it was allowing in math students. And so I went to Rockefeller. Now repeat the question because I got a little far afield. What was the question again? Well, Rota is well known for combinatorics related. Oh, yes. So did that influence you at all? John Carlo uh, had just come to Rockefeller. And John Carlo was much more than a combinatorialist. Uh, he, met, he built his reputation in probability theory and functional analysis. He basically invented the modern theory of combinatorics. He made it into a mathematical theory as opposed to a merely enumerative bag of tricks uh, while he was at Rockefeller. And in addition to that, um, uh, he was a professor of philosophy because he was a great student of epistemology. And so he was one of the people who got what I was trying to do because he could understand the philosophical importance of trying to understand mind and brain. He also was a very generous guy in so many ways. He knew that I was groping to discover things and I was so young still, what was I was 24. Um, and he gave me a huge amount of freedom and he protected me because at Rockefeller, it was built like a feudal society where the lab chiefs owned you. That's why I talk about slave labor. If a lab chief didn't like you and threw you out of the lab, you were done for at Rockefeller. And so Giancarlo, unlike the other lab chiefs, didn't want to turn me into his slave. He wanted to treat me like a butterfly, you know, finding my wings. And so I proved um, my first global limit and oscillation theory theorems about how content addressable memories work in my PhD thesis from Rockefeller. And at first, you know, I had derived these equations from studying list learning when I was a freshman at Dartmouth. And these were short-term memory, medium-term memory, and long-term memory equations. And I had done it in the service of trying to understand data about list learning. And I could explain to you in a moment why that was important, but as to how I got to my um, thesis theorems, uh, I didn't have a clue how to analyze these equations. You know, they're nonlinear, fast, slow feedback systems. And so John Carlo and Mark Katz, who was another famous mathematician there, sent me to Jurgen Moser, who was a very famous guy in celestial mechanic and mechanics and became director of the Quran Institute for Mathematical Sciences for Jurgen to help guide me. 
And Jurgen was the greatest guy in celestial mechanics, but the math for celestial mechanics just didn't work for this. And ultimately, I proved the theorems by using intuition about the learning process itself. And I made a number of changes of variables and then was able to prove these global theorems, which are very unusual in uh, differential equations. But as to um, how this all happened, how I got these equations, um, I, I mentioned that I had used differential equations already for my earliest work as a college freshman at Dartmouth. And my old friend, Matt Friedman, who was at Dartmouth is staring me in the face now. It really brings me back. And so the question was, how do you learn and remember lists of events or any kind of items, whether words or nonsense syllables? For example, there's a wonderful classical literature on serial verbal learning, where basically you learn a list of items by practicing it over and over again in the same order until you reach a criterion. So let's say, you know, the first item would come in, you, you'd see it in a window, you'd predict the next item, then the next item would come in, you predict the next item and you keep doing this predictive process until you could predict them all correctly, like how you might learn the alphabet or something. And why that got me going into differential equations was there's what's called the classical serial uh, position curve for cumulative errors during learning of a list. So after you have learned to criterion, you can see there are more errors made during the learning process in the middle of the list than the beginning and the end. And that happens in many things in life where you remember how things began and ended, but the middle is sort of a model. You might have thought that things would get harder and harder to learn as you got deeper in the list because there's more response interference due to what's happened before. But the end is easier to learn than the middle if the rest period between list presentations is longer than the rate of presenting the items one might add to the other. And increasing that rest period can um, dramatically change the distribution of errors. So that shows you that the non-occurrence of a future item during the rest period could influence learning of all the past items. And that grabbed me as being philosophically very exciting because it showed there was something going on backwards in time. And you know, in physics, there's backwards in time. Well, in psychology, there's backwards in time. And backward learning was a much simpler example of it, where if I'm trying to learn a short list like AD, I'm also partially learning the list BA. And then if I do A, B, C, I can learn BC, even though if I hadn't said C, I would have learned BA. So that shows there's a broken symmetry between the future and the past. And because you can go forwards and backwards in every which way, that forced me into a network of nodes that represented the items in the list. And there were associations between all the nodes. And there had to be multiple time scales because learning wasn't the same thing as the activation of these nodes. And moreover, there had to be a time scale finer than any of these behaviorally observable events, which parameterized them all, because just by resting longer, you change everything. And that forced me into differential equations with short-term memory, medium-term memory, and long-term memory to begin to understand how we learn lists of things. So it was really the verbal learning database that grabbed me when I was a kid because I thought it was philosophically exciting. The non-occurrence of something, wow. Okay. I, I, I often stress that um, even though 
um, people say that there's like there's a need to think more sophisticated ways about time. People often assume that things are happening in a very serial way, influenced by computer-based thinking. And, and you've kind of really drawn out how the actual time scale of a phenomenon really matters in that example. So well, I think- At the time I contrasted it with just, you know, A, B, C, D, E in a computer thing. And I, I loved, the little I understood about compute, because one of my most important mentors, John Kemeny, who was a professor of mathematics and became chairman of the Department of Mathematics, and he was a co co discoverer and developer of the basic computer language and of time sharing computer systems. So, you know, I loved all that, but what I loved even more was how different this was. So at the same time, we're trying to make computers more intelligent. I realized our intelligence is so, our kind of intelligence is so different. So the metaphor, we didn't need a metaphor. So I think we can uh, open up to questions now before we move to part two. Um, and there was so Giacomo uh, Aldigheri, do you still have a question? You had your hand up earlier. I can ask you to unmute. Hello, hi. Um, yeah, I was typing, I was told that I should type my question in the chat. So I was typing in there. Um, so I had a question concerning uh, deep learning, which you mentioned uh, uh, earlier. So it seems like every uh, modeling approach is always sacrificing some aspects of the system being modeled and uh, emphasizing others. So for example, in the case of deep learning, um, you are de-emphasizing the plausibility of the learning process of the learning alg algorithm, and you're um, gaining other benefits. Uh, for example, the ability to process real world data, like data that's for example, like images of the real world that is more comparable to what um, organisms are exposed to. So do you think that the, for Could example, learning? Could I respond to that before you go on? Yeah, sure. Deep learning is just a feed forward adaptive filter. And multiple models, can do classification of data. Deep learning doesn't do it in real time. It has slow learning. You have to do it offline with a supervisor and you might have to repeat cats hundreds and hundreds of times. But I looked at your face and I know it now. And if I see you in a year, if I'm still here, I'll probably recognize you. That's fast one try learning, no way. Moreover, the fact that it's untrustworthy and unreliable are crushing, crushing problems. You can't use it for any database that isn't a toy problem because as soon as you get in the real world, someone's gonna sue the hell out of you for making a prediction that you can't explain. You should take that to heart. So what do you, th um, what do you think would be the, the biggest issues with, um, so just to clarify, I'm talking about deep learning in the broadest sense possible. So no, it's an anything, not just for example, feed forward, but also recurrent, but uh, also not just supervised, but also unsupervised. Um, so any, basically any back propagation fueled the system. Well, then let's so what do you think are the main? propagation typically has non-local transport of adaptive mm -hmm. weights. I view that as crippling. It can't do anything in real time. You know, I mean, when you're back propagating your weights from one part of the network to another, you're not in real time anymore. So you could call it recurrent, non-recurrent, but I, I haven't heard you tell me that it can operate autonomously in real time without 
experiencing catastrophic forgetting at times that are unpredictable. Can it? And if so, how? You cannot, I mean, people are trying to, uh, to make it solve that problem, but uh, so far they haven't had much success. So I, I do agree. Um, My question for you is, mm -hmm. why bother when adaptive resonance theory solved the problem decades ago and has been used for very large scale applications? Very large scale. Just search at the CNS Tech Lab webpage for a partial list of applications 10 or 11 years ago. Uh, look at Don Wunsch's article in the 2019 December issue of Neural Networks where he talks about enormous numbers of large scale engineering applications that are actually fielded, not using deep learning. I, I, I just I think we should we should probably move move along now and and uh, and because uh, the deep the deep net stuff will can keep going. So why don't we let uh, Louise? Um, oh, we'll look up. Thank so, you. Uh, yeah. By the way, there's a Julia package that Donald Wunsch and others uh, have set up for doing uh, adaptive resonance theory. So and it looks really good. So if you'd like to try that out, that's probably a good thing to try out. So let's move to um, uh, Louise Pessoa has has a question. Hi, Steve. Yeah, so I was I was uh, thinking about the way you were describing this, um, describing your thought process as 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 almost like a logical derivation of some principles, and how in the in the beginning or the early early phase, you were deeply fascinated and interested in these psychological principles and trying to derive derive it from the psycho, psychological realm and eventually this led to to models that reflected a lot of neural processing so i'm 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 trying to wrap my my head around the the issue of so in a sense when do you become more interested in 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 neural data or the brain or was that that was there in the background or is it not so much an inspiration or I, th that's what i'm trying to understand where does the neural come on because i i went to the department and i studied with you and because of the um, combination of 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 mind and brain which obviously is is all your your your, your work but it's it's fascinating to hear how much the psychological drove the push that that to the fore that this, these principles. So, so I'm curious to see if you could explain to us a little bit more. I mean, let me clarify things that might not have been uh, as clear as they could have been about this method. So, you know, when I'm starting in a new area, I'll typically start with psychological data because of the reason I said, and I will think about it hard until I can see a real time adaptive way to embody it. The speculative leap between the data and a design principle is the hardest thing. And there's really no logical way to explain it. That's what it means to develop intuition and the best way to learn intuition is to study with someone who has it as you develop models together, which you and I did. Um, but remember what I said that after you make the link, you press both bottom up from psychology and top down from brain um, until You've explained all that you can at that stage of the derivation is that pressure from the bottom up and top down that can point your mind to what's left out. And then you can begin again. Now, today, after so many years of doing this over a half century, it's all in my head all at once. So I can often, you know, it, a lot of the data I see, I feel, oh, that's just that, or that's, that's just that, because of this organization of data into principles and then a few foundational mechanisms. I mean, maybe I should say a little more that 
over all these years, but in just a small number of equations. I mentioned three of the most basic. And then a somewhat larger number of uh, fundamental modules or microcircuits. And one of the questions was gonna lead me into explaining the importance of on center off surround networks that obey membrane equations, whether recurrent or non-recurrent. That is a particular kind of microcircuit uh, and the membrane equations are shown in dynamics and that is expressed in much more general terminology, a mass action cooperative competitive network. And there are many variations of that network, some of them embodied in theorems. I have a theorem, one of whose applications is the design of a stable economic market. You know, it has nothing to do with brain anymore even. So there's a small number of equations, a somewhat larger number of fundamental microcircuits, and then they're assembled into what I call modal architectures for different modalities of intelligence like vision and audition and cognition and emotion, what have you. And so there's this tremendous unity uh, of foundations in all the models. And I think that's one of the reasons why the brain could self-organize so well over evolution because it's exploiting a shared ancient substrate. Like everywhere you look in brains, you'll see on center of surround networks because they solved what I call the noise saturation dilemma, which is how do you process distributed patterns of inputs and brains are self-organizing pattern processing devices, but you don't have to look only at brains. The on center off surround architecture, I found at least in my own limited studies, holds in all cellular tissues, whether they're neural or non-neural. And in what year was it? It was a long time ago, in 1978, along with my foundational paper called The Theory of Human Memory, I published an article called uh, Communication, Memory and Development, where I showed that homologs of short-term memory and long-term memory dynamics, but here expressed in terms of regulated growth processes, like a, how a blastula can become a gastrula, how Hydra can regenerate new heads, things having nothing to do with brain, um, seem to obey similar laws. And now that stuff is just, you know, a very introductory invitation to a younger generation to go with it. Because I could do just so much. I mentioned it at the end of my book because I think you know, maybe my book will call it to the attention of that younger generation and not in a, you know, a place that hardly anyone reads progress in theoretical biology. <coughs> so did that clarify a little bit? All right. Um, so there's another question that was typed uh, in by, um, I hope I'm not mispronouncing it, Mat Matthew Tiboust. Um, so given the uh, advantages of art models over deep learning models, uh, why do you think art models uh, are not yet widespread in the AI, AI community? Is it a marketing and communication issue, uh, technical implementational challenges, incompleteness of the theory, lack of use cases? Uh, so what, what do you think is the reason for the lack of uptake? I think one reason is, is Deep learning is backpropagation on steroids. So backpropagation, you know, it's a feed forward adaptive filter. It could only do slow learning. It experienced catastrophic forgetting. It needed non-local transport of weights. It had a lot of problems. It was used for a while. People, I was at a, a, a talk where Dave Rummelhart was promoting it like he was in the you know, save the world, even though it was not discovered by Dave Rummelhart. Uh, it was discovered 
by people like Shinichi Amari, David Parker, and mainly Paul Werbos. And basically, Paul was heartbroken that Roma Hart plagiarized him, to, not to put too fine a point on it. So that prop then became popular due to uh, a lot of marketing, where there was no effort to compare it to any other model or to explain its limitations. But then people found out its limitations. You know, it could experience catastrophic forgetting. It was very, very slow, et cetera, et cetera. And it lost popularity. But in the interim, two important things happened. One, vast uh, databases emerged on the World Wide Web. So there are millions of pictures of cats that anybody can find with a Google search. And computer networks became blindingly fast. And so these foundational weaknesses of backprop could be papered over by being able to run millions of pictures of cats so that you could put in a new cat and they'll say cat. But that's not the same thing as being able to learn an invariant representation of a cat. And in the brain, that takes very, very little um, architecture. I mean, not to go into all the var variations, but uh, the infratemporal cortex, the posterior part, uh, typically can learn view-specific, position-specific, size specific categories, but by the time you get to the anterior part of infratemporal cortex, you can learn invariant categories. And if you've seen in my book, I talk at the end about the predictive art architecture, which I think I published in 2018 or 19. And it has many other parts of the brain, like seven different parts of prefrontal cortex doing different things and multiple parts of the emotional motivational system interacting with the thinking system and so on and so forth. But the actual categorization part is just a small part of the brain. So I'm, and if you go to deep learning, you know, often when in trouble, people add another layer. So there may be a hundred layers. Well, there aren't a hundred regions in, in brain. I mean, there's no room for all that. You could learn arbitrary sequences of repeated categories in three levels. And there is room for that using art and uh, multiple scale of classifiers that I call masking fields. And it's dynamically self-stabilizing. So it doesn't experience catastrophic forgetting. And there's another thing which wasn't mentioned, but I want to mention, which is vigilance control. Like when I'm looking at something, I have to know how much detail is important to make a prediction. And we're as lazy as we can be. We try to learn the most general categories we can. And children are well known to be overgeneralizers. But then when I say, um, I look at a dog and I say, oh, it's a dog. And they say, no, that's my dog spot. Then I have to be able to refocus my attention to be able to spontaneously discover the particular combinations of critical features to which I should pay attention, learn to pay attention to know that spot, that's not another, another dog. And there's nothing like vigilance control uh, that's naturally incorporating deep learning. Maybe there's an epicycle for it. And when I say vigilance control, we now have, uh, especially uh, uh, there was a series of studies, but like Jesse Palmer was on before. I don't know if Jesse's still here. Jesse Palmer and Max Versace, you know, we developed an understanding of digital control that was right down to biophysics, biochemistry, and detailed laminar 
circuitry like uh, a non-specific thalamus could get activated by a big enough mismatch that would activate the nucleus basalis, nucleus basalis, which spritz acetylcholine across uh, the layer five or multiple cortical areas, and that would go through a loop in cortex that would increase vigilance and cause the learning of finer categories. And, you know, that exists. So first the prediction was made with Gail Carpenter based on functional psychological uh, requirements. And now, you know, it's been incomplete, but it's a physical, biochemical, biophysical, anatomical, neurophysiological theory. And when it breaks down, I was able to show all sorts of um, behavioral symptoms of mental disorders that depend upon the nucleus based alice and cholinergic dynamics. And so I was able to publish things about Alzheimer's disease, et cetera, autism. Not that these things are only compromised by that, but it's one of the factors. And I never could have done it without our method. So, so, you know, it's the gift that keeps on giving, I like to say. If you're willing to honor the data and try to see designs behind big enough databases that can give you clues of design, it can lead you to places you never dreamed you'd go. And that's why 64 years later, I'm still publishing. I never hit a brick wall. The method is so conservative. All right. Um, I think we can move on to uh, all these parts are loosely structured. And we're already getting into specific stuff, but I thought now we could uh, talk a little bit with a little bit more detail about some mathematical ideas yep. and some mathematical comparisons also. Johan, so, yes. if I might just add to what ah. Steve was saying, just an ah, yeah. extra step to what Steve was saying, because we kind of like I slightly veered off into more more of this deep net thing, which I don't think we should be doing. We have other things to talk about. Like even in the critique that Steve made in 1988 about the whole back propagation based systems, the 17 problems that he enumerated, only one of them has been picked up, the, the so-called weight transport problem. And they make it like almost like a cottage industry every two years to say that this can be implemented in the brain one way or the other, and then forget the rest of the 16 problems he has kind of enumerated and saying that this is unrealistic, but it just keeps going that way. <laughs> Karthik, what I ask for from deep learning, Karthik, it, it's fine with me if deep learning is useful in an application, use it. Yep. You could use anything that works for you. But why do people keep saying it's how the brain works? If it's mm -hmm. how the brain works, then you have to explain data. Exactly. Then you have to explain data at least as well as the leading theories of that capability. And those theories are often theories that I and my many collaborators, over a hundred gifted PhD students and postdocs, including you, worked like dogs to publish. And so it's their intellectual dishonesty or ignorance that I find intolerable. You don't have a theory of the brain unless you explain a ton of data about the brain in a principled way. I can't, can't argue with that. Uh, definitely a pet peeve of the, you know, every one or two years, somebody says, oh, we found a way to say backprop is happening in the brain. It seems like terrible waste of time to me. Uh, oh, Mac has a question. Uh, I will uh, let Mac uh, say what he had. Go for it. Hi, Steve. Um, uh, I just wanted to kind of jump on that real quick. I, I think you're totally spot on. And I think deep learning um, is really interesting, but maybe not a great uh, match for what the brain is doing. And, you know, we should treat it as interesting in its own right. But to, to pick up that point you just made about um, a, a really good theory of the brain uh, explaining data, I think another kind of really challenging aspect of that um, sort of uh, question is our observation model. So we, we can go from a really detailed circuit model. I think you've done a lot of beautiful work showing how, you know, very precise neural circuits can give rise to, 
functions that might mimic some of the things that we think brains can do, vigilance being a really lovely example. But we also really don't have, I think, a great handle on how, let's say, um, you know, uh, firing in pyramidal neurons or interneurons in the cortex gives rise to particular patterns of bold or how LFPs emerge from complex interactions between well, the neurons. How would what emerge? Uh, something like the signal we like the bold signal that we might um, collect local at field a really low resolution. And so for me, I think there's a large disconnect between the kind of complex details that you've been working for on for so long and really kind of refining and how that would actually show up to us in the kinds of measurements that we collect typically in a sort of normal scan. And I think that's why I'm a bit nervous about trying to make sure that that kind of um, match to data is a real arbiter or rather a guiding principle that we are then open to change over time and say, okay, as we get better and better observation models, now we can start to refine and say, actually, the model we had before was pretty good, but it was missing this one key detail. And so I, I think there's a real dialogue between them that we're missing as a field. I just wanted to hear your comments on that. Well, everything I've talked about is that dialogue. I always start with data. However, I don't view imaging data as fundamental data. I think that they're useful data to guide where to look at mostly, because there's nothing in imaging data that tells you about the dynamics of networks of neurons on the functional level. And, and just to be very clear, I predicted the processing negativity event-related potential. I explained why with Jean-Paul Banquet, they're often series of P120 and 200, P300 event-related potentials and what their functional role is as natural uh, events in an art search cycle when it's trying to learn a new category or to correct a predictive error. And I was working with Manny Donshin at that time, who was the leading P300 uh, experimentalist in the world. He was at the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. And Manny didn't really understand the functional significance of P300. I had to teach it to him because out of the context of the underlying system dynamics, it's just guesswork. And I didn't guess about P300. I was forced into that sequence of events. It's mismatch, reset. It's mismatch, arousal, reset. P120 and 200, P300. That is core in an art search cycle, okay? And processing negativity is just the readout of a learned top-down expectation that's matched against critical features to focus attention on predictive combinations of features, which are the features that will then be learned in bottom-up adaptive filters and top-down expectations, which is why art is explainable, because you know exactly what it's coding and what it's using to make predictions. So just to give a quick gloss on what Mac just said. About deep learning, without something like short-term memory or neurons, neuronal activation, you really can't have an explainable theory. At least I don't think you can. If you can, show me. I, I was just, there's a quick, I thought I could just elaborate a little bit on what I think Mac was talking about, because we've been talking about uh, coarse graining some of these ideas and seeing how they match. So one way to think about it is that um, there are these slow dynamics that may potentially relate to things that the COG EM model covers, but it's not always clear how you might engage in a principled coarse graining of the fine network data. Uh, so you could think of this sort of even if it is not fun fundamental data, the fMRI data is, is a sort of coarse grain constraint, meaning that whatever a smaller or more detailed network does it do, it would presumably have to exhibit similar kinds of metabolic patterns. So have you thought about how to coarse grain, say a large number of art networks 
or a, or a big scale thing so that you say, well, this is what it will probably look like at the metabolic level? Well, if someone wants to model what they're seeing in their um, imaging data, then uh, I think it's important that they write down a model of how your data are reflecting scalp potentials and how the scalp potentials are reflecting underlying neuronal dynamics. And it's only if you do that, that you can talk about this in a quantitative way. I'm not gonna do that, that doesn't interest me. Because what interests me is what's going on inside the brain. I'm no more interested in that than I'm interested in designing the next best microelectrode or the next best uh, optical imaging method. That's not what I do. But people who want to use those methods to make a link with stuff that's already been powerful and explaining stuff, I think really, um, really need to do that. That's their job, not mine. Um, and you know, so I think we can frustrated that yeah. why didn't I do it? Well, I can't do everything. <laughs> Let's uh, John. John Cannon has a question. Let's go to John. All right. So uh, it seems like we know what you think of uh, deep learning models of brain and mind, but uh, what do you think about um, hierarchical Bayesian models and the tradition of um, Carl Friston at this point, uh, models of mind? Well. Well, I have notes about that somewhere, but we're so out of order. I'll try to do it on the fly. First, I think Carl Tristan is an incredibly smart man um, in terms of like free energy principle or something like that. If it's useful, I think you should use it. But then I ask, well, what data has Carl explained? And I have to say, I don't know very much data that Carl's explained. That's not his thing. But then it's really not about mind and brain anymore. It's about, you know, using optimality or conservation principles to do elegant applied mathematics. And I'll tell you many years ago, you know, I when I was first learning about conservation laws and physics and optimality principles, I was dying, dying, dying to find them. So, you know, I like unifying stuff. And that's what led me and also with Mike Cohen, among others, to discover Lyapunov functions, where Lyapunov functions are functions which when applied uh, to a, a suitably defined class of systems and you take its time derivative, the time derivative is either non-negative or non-positive for all time. So the system monotonically converges to a limit and often the Lapinov function is a kind of energy principle. And so it shows you're minimizing energy over time. But the real power of it was, it was a way to prove limit theorems. Um, and so we tried to develop the most general ones we could and the most general systems. And one of those systems is now called the cohn grossberg model. And all the Apinov function is called the cohn grossberg Apinov function, which includes the so-called Hopfield model, which I say so-called because um, I wrote down a Lyapunov function that included that model a year before he did. So no, two years before actually. So, and he knew about it. <laughs> so I, I don't wanna say more about that. So yeah, so I very much respect Carl, but Carl's doing something different. 
And there are a lot of things to do that are useful, which don't have to be explaining how brains work. And many people have derived inspiration from thinking about biological intelligence who then don't actually develop theories that explain biological intelligence. You know, when they're useful in technology, we'll often call it an artificial neural network. But Carl isn't doing neural networks at all to the best of my knowledge. So he's somewhat further afield. Very high regard for him, he's doing something else. All right, so that actually is a nice seg into a question which uh, I did send you, but it's a little bit further down. Oh, well, actually, maybe not. Um, regarding the, a contrast between um, these sort of trade-offs and, and cost functions. So one thing I like about, about your work is that in several places, you pointed to certain key trade-offs, which maybe you can elaborate a little on, such as the stability plasticity dilemma. Um, and that strikes me as sort of similar, but also different from thinking in terms of cost function. So could you contrast the cost function way of thinking with the trade-off way of thinking, the dilemma way of thinking? Well, let me, after that, I really need my notes. So let me try to find my way here so I don't forget to say something. <clears throat> so um, by trade-offs, um, uh, I, the thing that I think of in terms of my most general work on trade-offs is what I call complementary computing. And um, it explains, I believe, aspects of the nature of brain specialization. Uh, many scientists have proposed that our brains process independent modules, as in a digital computer. Um, and the brain has distinct anatomical areas, and so surely the brain as specialized processing, <coughs> but independent modules should fully compute their particular process on their own. Uh, like in vision, I mean, Patrick Kavanaugh, who I admire a great deal, would have a model in vision where the image is broken up into depth, color, luminance, motion, independent modules, but that's just not what the data show. During vision, it's known there are strong interactions between brightness and depth, motion and color, motion and depth, texture and depth, texture and motion, and so on. And, and those things are important clues to what's going on. So complementary computing asserts that there are pairs of parallel processing streams, which we know are there from the anatomy, that are computing complementary processes, pro complementary properties in the brain. And each of the streams has complementary computational strengths and weaknesses. And you often need several processing stages of interactions within the stream and between the streams to overcome these complementary deficiencies. And I like saying they realize a kind of hierarchical resolution of uncertainty. Um, so complementary computing shows how properties that control observable behaviors emerge from interactions between pairs of complementary cortical processing streams with multiple processing stages. As in the Van Nessen diagram, and one of my favorite examples is showing that visual boundaries are computationally complementary to visual surfaces. And, and there are many examples of complementary processes. And my book summarizes some of them. And they occur not only between cortical streams like the, the, the ventral watt stream and the dorsal wear stream, but within 
the West stream, there's an MT plus and an MT minus and an MST. Um, uh, I'm blocking on what the, there's an MST, pro, uh, a projection of each of them, one who's based more on visual navigation, uh, uh, using optic flow, the other's based more about target tracking during spatial, during visual navigation. So there's a, a, a cascade of broken symmetries that create complementary processes on multiple scales in our brains. And I think a person who solves that problem, uh, what is the genetic and morphogenetic substrate that causes the unfolding of these complementary processes that will revolutionize our understanding of why brains look the way they do. I'll never do it, but I've like given a foundation that I think is secure enough to build on. And you would ask about the difference between that kind of thing and things like opponent processing, which aren't really computationally complementary in the sense that I said, and one basic reason is, um, let's say I'm a pigeon and I'm in a Skinner box and uh, the evil experimentalist has electrified the floor. And so now I'm feeling terrible pain and fear, trying to keep my feet off the box, lurching around, trying to get the hell out. And I bump into the red button and the shock shuts off and I feel a wave of relief. The relief is a positive motivation, which I can use to learn an escape reaction in the future. But the problem is that when you shut off the shock input, there's no further external input coming into the network. So what is the input that energizes the rebound of relief? And why is it just transient? And for that, you need to understand that the, the opponent channels of fear and relief or red or green or whatever are tonically activated by an equal tonic baseline. And so when you're feeling fear, that input is habituating the medium term memory, uh, that channel and so when you shut it off, the net input to the relief channel from the tonic input is transiently bigger. And there is nothing like tonic arousal of complementary streams for starters. So opponent processing is there to try to adaptively rebalance your processing in response to predictive errors or other unexpected changes. The rebound can be thought of more generally as a way to rebalance the circuit. You know, what this has to do with is why, why isn't every percept horribly smeared as a object moves across our visual field? So, how can we track an object without a comet's tail of persistence smearing the whole visual field? And this has to do with opponent processing. And to, to, to make a case for that, you know, Greg Francis and I uh, simulated basically the whole parametric uh, database on persistence. Um, and so I say it with some confidence. All right, uh, thank you. That, that, that was a uh, very spot on there. Oops, I uh, accidentally muted you. Um, so. Was I just muted? Yeah, you? I was actually, yeah, I think I accidentally muted you. So I what I was going to move on to was this idea. So dynamical systems theory is, is becoming slightly more popular. It's always been around. Uh, but one thing you want 
might notice reading your book is that you don't you use differential equations and you definitely are interested in stability, but you don't necessarily uh, talk in terms of attractors, bifurcations, things like that, or at least I haven't come across much along those lines. Uh, so how would you kind of um, describe the contrast between your way of thinking and the dynamical systems toolbox? Well, it's not a contrast. Um, so every convergence theorem uh, that I prove uh, converges to an attractor uh, or, you know, some of the stuff Mike Cohen and I did, you know, conver converging to an oscillator, uh, a, you know, an oscillatory target, that's another kind of attractor. So we've done a lot of mathematical work on that. Using the word attractor adds nothing to the analysis. As to um, uh, singularities, there are phase transitions in memory. And I talk about phase transitions in memory. And the person who's really done a lot more than I to use words like uh, singularity, Gail Carpenter, because in her work on the Hodgkin-Huxley, the generalized Hodgkin-Huxley equation, um, there's a manifest fast slow manifold and jumping, you know, fast to slow to fast. That's what a spike is going down the axon. So in Gale's work, it's uh, sufficiently clear in the theorem that, you know, that language is very appropriate. And she uh, worked from some of the foundational work that Charles Conley at Wisconsin, then at Colorado had, had developed. But yeah, there, there's a lot of fast flow dynamics in my work, but just adding those words, you know, and I, I, I wanna say there's another reason for it, like Steve Smale, who's a really great guy in dynamical systems, as well as Mo Hirsch, they're trying to prove theorems that hold generically about all systems of a certain kind. And even systems that, they don't even know how to write down. One of the things that really annoyed me when I was a graduate student, I heard a lecture about what was it, log, log. And it wasn't log pole, it was log modular dynamics, something like that. And it was all existence proofs and, you know, convergence, you know, you know, in the probabilistic sense. And I asked, well, could you write down one example, please, so I can wrap my mind around it? They didn't have any. So, I mean, this is very different. Here are the examples are king. And I like starting with a simple example and then flying as high as I can uh, to show how a larger class of systems can serve critical properties of that example. Yeah, that's, that was great. Um, so one question that came up, I don't remember if it's in the, what I sent you, was as a result of trying to implement um, art uh, in this with this new Julia package for some from data sets, this, this topic came up of you have um, vigilance uh, and you have, which kind of co controls the quality of a match. Um, and how, whether you want to have very narrow categories and the, whether you want to have very um, large and vague categories. But uh, in at least some of the implementations of art, there doesn't seem to be, uh, at least present in the system, a kind of confidence or sort of degree of confidence in like once you once you actually make a match. So is that something that you could add easily using the, 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 the uh, pieces or is it there and we, did, we just didn't notice it? Well, <clears throat> Gail Carpenter has developed uh, first to have confidence, you have to have an answer to have confidence in the answer. 
And so that requires that you go into supervised art systems, generically called art map systems. They can be fuzzy art map. They could be a generalized art map. They could be um, default art map. And in that context of Gail has shown how starting like with a uh, um, remote sensing data, very hard databases or medical databases where you can have multiple observers and each observer can use different uh, labels for similar features or inconsistent labels or missing labels or incorrect labels. Gail showed in an art map system how out of that uh, it could discover a, a cognitive hierarchy of if then rules. And she, you know, look at some of her papers, go to the uh, bu.techlab.edu webpage, look for Gail Carpenter and you'll see some of those papers. So you can have confidence between in the predictions, this note implies that, no, this note implies that. So Gail did that, I think, in a lovely way. But that requires you look at art map systems and there be enough analog processing that it's not just yes, no. So look at Gail's work for that. So uh, on the topic of adaptive resonance, um, the word resonance, uh, so I come from a physics background. So when I saw that initially, I thought, well, it doesn't seem quite like resonance in say a physical oscillator where you have kind of energy transfer. Um, so could you comment a little bit on, on the use of that word? Is it, is it just a metaphor or is there more to it than that potentially linked to energy transfer? Well, first in order to, Around what we're going to say, I want to read you what Wikipedia says resonance is. Okay. So resonance, resonance describes the phenomenon of increased amplitude that occurs when the frequency of a periodically applied force is equal to or close to the natural frequency of the system on which it acts. When an oscillating force is applied to a resonant frequency of a dynamical system, the system will oscillate at a higher amplitude than when the same force is applied at other non-resonant frequencies. So let me comment about how I use the concept in art, if only to compare it with the physical idea. And there are reasons for it. In art, resonances occur, as some of you surely know, when excitatory feedback signals between two or more brain regions match their signals well enough to cause the active cells to synchronize and sustain their firing long enough to trigger learning. And the matching process can be oscillatory or it can go to steady state. And that just depends on parameters. Like if you have a slower response of inhibitory in the neurons, it tends to bifurcate from a steady state into a, a synchronous oscillation. And we had results on that many, many years ago. And um, if they synchronize and sustain their firing long enough, that'll trigger learning. And that's why I call the theory adaptive resonance theory. And so Art explains how multiple processing stages in our brains use these excitatory bottom up and top down interactions to learn to attend recognize and predict objects and events in the changing world. So the top-down expectations in art dynamics 
play a role that you don't have in physical resonance because there's no learning there. Um, the top-down matching in art is there to prevent catastrophic forgetting, which you can have in deep learning because it's only a p-port adaptive filter. And so this matching process solves what I call the stability plasticity dilemma. How can learning be fast and stable without that triggering the rewrite or the overriding of previously learned stuff? And so the kind of matching in art that ensures this property, you can't just do any matching law. Uh, Gail and I call it the art matching rule. And the simplest realization of it is a top down modulatory on center. I'll say what that means in a minute, off surround network. So it is an off surround shunting network, but the on center is modulatory. And so matching occurs when a learned top down expectation activates the network to match it against the bottom of input and you can buy the cells. But all by itself, the top down expectation can modulate target cells. It can sensitize them, it can prime them uh, to get ready for stuff that hasn't yet happened, but it can't fire them to supra threshold levels without matching bottom of input. And that's really quite different from a physical resonance. Also different is that the art matching rule enables the top-down expectations to select, attend, and learn what I call critical feature patterns. And these are the features that we attend because they have successfully predicted uh, uh, valued outcomes in the past. Um, so the critical features are then also learned in the bottom-up adaptive filter adaptive weights and the top-down learn expectation adaptive weights. And that's why art is explainable. You know that the critical features are controlling your learning both bottom up and top down and your predictions. And because there's nothing like activations and attention in deep learning, it can't solve that problem. So it's not just a detail, it's foundational. Um, and uh, that's a good actual opportunity to, to link it with another uh, question to do with um, predictive processing, which is becoming quite popular nowadays. And this is a, a point which I keep repeating to people, but I'd like you to also chime in because, which is that the top down, uh, I mean, the bottom up signals in these predictive processing circuits are just errors. Um, and that it, that it just what? Are just errors. So in the Rao and Ballard, for instance, uh, or a lot of these canonical cort cortical microcircuit yeah. models, well, they well, only seem to pass errors around. So would you like to comment on why that's not, that there's a problem with doing just that? The matching is purely inhibited. And so what you haven't inhibited is, in, is left over, but it sort of gets things backwards because what you're matching in real life is the stuff you want, not the stuff you don't want. And maybe they've done it, but I haven't seen uh, Dana, Dana's work or, What's his name? He's a great mathematician at Harvard. Um, he won the Fields Medal. You know, brilliant guys. I haven't well, seen them, I haven't seen them learn anything. And the last time I was at a lecture, David Mumford. The last time I was a lecture that one of them gave, I asked them. I said, "Well, you don't learn anything, or do you?" And they didn't say they did. Now maybe now they can. I don't see how they can. So, um, yeah, uh, and it doesn't need any data. Now that doesn't mean there isn't mismatch mismatching in the brain. And so the art matching rule with an excitatory modulatory on center occurs quite ubiquitously 
in the ventral cortical stream for perception and cognition, but in the where stream for spatial representation and action, you have complementary mismatch dynamics and mismatch based learning. But the goal of the mismatch dynamics is to learn a match. So for example, let's say I'm looking at a position in space and it activates uh, a, a representation of my posterior parietal cortex. And that is now gonna read out a top-down adaptive filter to a matching interface. And I'm gonna get bottom-up inhibitory signals that are correlated discharges of where my hand is now. And so if my hand goes where I wanna go, which is where I'm looking, that mismatch should be zero because I am where I wanna go. And that mismatch learning is designed in order to correct the coordinates uh, of the top-down expectation. So they match the coordinates of the um, uh, um, present position vector. So then in the future, if you wanna go somewhere else than you are now, there will be a mismatch which will compute a difference vector that will accurately compute the direction you wanna go and how far you wanna go. So there's a very uh, basic reason for doing that. And it explains a ton of data in the parietal prefrontal literature, as well as experimental literature. You know, Dan Bullock and I did a lot of work on uh, arm movements and the simplest kind of vector associative map, I like to call it, or VAM, which is computationally complementary to art, was uh, our VEAT model, vector integration endpoint model for um, reaching. And we used it to explain a lot of data about arm movement, physiology, anatomy, and psychophysics. So there is mismatch and it does not satisfy the stability plasticity dilemma in the spatial and motor domain because you don't want to remember the controller that you use to move your baby body. You want to continually update those spatial and motor controllers. Like if I go work out at the gym today, I want to be able to even update the motor gain that I'm gonna to use to move these powerful new arms. So that is going through catastrophic forgetting, but it's good in the spatial and motor system. Like when I grew up, the spacing between my eyes, the position of my eyes relative to my body, the position of my eyes relative to my body relative to the length of my arm, all those things are changing. They have to be forgotten. And that's what VAM dynamics do. That is a great point, actually. I, I really like that about the um, uh, compl com computational complementarity of that kind of motor learning. Um, so before we um, move on to the sort of big questions, does anyone have any questions they'd like to slip in here? There are more of a sort of technical questions. <laughs> well, the big the big words that often have very simple <laughs> answers. <laughs> um, the, yeah, any any questions at this point, or we can move on to uh, language and things like that. Maybe more speculative. <laughs> I'll just move on, and you, people can jump in. So. Um, uh, if, if you look at your book and uh, you see uh, there's perception, some very uh, sophisticated models of perception and, and perceptual illusions and depth computation, objects, uh, attending to objects in place and, and that for vision and, and hearing modalities and motor control. 
Um, uh, and so you, uh, someone interested in higher cognition who often doesn't think about any of that stuff might ask, is something like language or any kind of rule-based um, thought process, can that be explained using these principles? Um, so how would you approach that? Well, so you want to skip over your question on metacognition, that's fine. Well, that you can fit that in here if you like, but let's start with this. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, I have done a lot of work with quite a few gifted colleagues on speech development and perception and word recognition, notably about how speech, <coughs> including language utterances, can be learned and remembered without experience and catastrophic forgetting. And that introduced, um, it clarified the functional units that are used in speech and language. And it also identified design principles and networks that you need to understand it. One being what I call the long-term memory invariance principle which clarifies how babies can learn language so quickly without catastrophic forgetting. And a network called masking fields, which clarifies how variable length lists of items that are stored in working memory, as every language utterance is, even though they have variable length, they can be classified. So I have developed those foundations and used it to explain a lot of our data about the temporal dynamics and uh, psychophysical properties of speech and language. And there's some wonderful people whose work I devotedly try to explain, including um, people at the Haskins lab. Um, to give teeth to those explanations. And I think that those foundations will help to develop increasingly mature models of language learning and comprehension. And from there to symbolic reasoning. Now, symbols already exist in art. Keep in mind that art categories are symbols and that an art resonance binds the symbols to the critical features that give the symbols meaning. So in this limited sense of meaning, um, that's what that bound state gives you as a foundational tool. Uh, also the ultimate kind of symbolic reasoning, perhaps it's done in mathematics, and some of you may know that in 2003, Dimitri Repin and I published the first article on how to represent small numbers in analog maps as many terrestrial animals do to do foraging behaviors. You know, like if I'm an animal and there are seven nuts here and six nuts there in two piles and to the left there are eight nuts and one nut. Well, the biggest pile is here, but there are more nuts here. The animals always go to the right combination within limits. That's something we share with all foraging terrestrial animals. But then Dimitri and I also showed how you can uh, learn much larger place value numbers, you know, 20, 100, 1,000, which is the foundation of all of our mathematics. And we did that in what we call the extended spatial number network. Now that's just the first step, but what I'm saying is that there are a number of first steps with foundations that have been supported by explaining a lot of very hard parametric data. And so I think that their foundations will be helpful. Um, now as to 
language meanings and stuff like that. Um, I did have some things I definitely wanted to say about that. I have totally lost my place. If I can't see it in a minute, I will. Um, Um, well, one of the things I'm working on now, just to put it in perspective, so you don't get the wrong idea that I think I've explained everything, which I emphatically don't believe. Now I'm, I'm working on trying to better understand how uh, very young children learn language meanings um, from their experiences with caregivers like parents. So, you know, like uh, your mom might say, oh, watch Johnny run, or Johnny threw the ball, or stuff like that. How from those real time experiences, you can not only represent the uh, perceptual events, but also the linguistic uh, events that are linked to them to give them perceptual meaning. That's hard, but I am working on it and I'm sure I will just, you know, get started and it's a project for the next decades, century perhaps. So that hasn't been finished. So on that note, I'd, I'd love to hear your speculations on something that has been, I've been thinking about a lot lately, which is um, basically the nature of relations and which relates in a way to the combinatorial power of symbols. So for instance, it's very easy to parse the idea. What kind of relations? So I'm going to give some examples. So, so, so for instance, the dog, man bites dog means something completely different from dog bites man. So the, 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 the verb expresses a relation where the order in which you experience the, the nouns on either side make a big difference to parsing it. So this is not quite the same as categorization, at least out of the box, art doesn't seem to necessarily do things like this as far as I know. But so how would you think about starting to frame, uh, say relations between yeah, nouns? Sure. Uh, um, I never talk about stuff that I'm not confident enough to write it up because um, I, I just don't like bullshit. But to get started, before you get off the ground, you have to understand how to design working memories. Like how would I store any list of symbols a, B, A, C, B, D, for example, any list, any sequence that has repeated items. If you don't know how to do that, you can't get started. Now, I worked very hard with a number of very smart people and um, showed, as I mentioned a few moments ago, you can derive such circuits from basic principles like long-term memory invariance principle and use it to explain a lot of data. So you need that. You need the working memory, you need to learn plans, you need to know how out of contents of working memory, you can select different combinations of things that are going to be predictive in a given environment. Um, you need to know all the stuff about uh, form and motion perception and category learning. You need all these things. These are all tools. And my answer, if I ever get to the point where I feel I understand some foundational examples well enough to have some uh, use for further generalization, we'll use the whole thing, the whole gamut of auditory, visual, uh, cognitive uh, dynamics. So it's not something you speculate about. I would have to get into how they all work. <laughs>
and why it's relevant. For example, something I didn't understand until I published the predictive art model was how it is that the stuff you store in a prefrontal working memory can be selective, how you can leave out stuff that isn't contextually relevant at the moment. That's necessary. You know, I, I could give you a lecture on that. You know, it's beyond speculation, but it isn't answer. It's in a gray zone where you just, you know, in my mind, before I have anything to say about anything, I have to see the answer and feel the answer. I'm still seeing and feeling. I know the dimensions that are necessary. I'm trying to develop new dimension so they'd be sufficient to give me a few examples, but I don't have a story yet in sentences to tell you, just don't have it. Likewise, you'd ask me about music. Well, I love music. And so in 2000, no, no, music, I have a paper under review now about how we can learn and perform lyrics and melodies with variable rhythms and beats. And I only dared to do that because I had a lot of foundations in, again, how we design working memories, how we categorize them, what kind of biological oscillators could be used for rhythmic and beat uh, regulation, and trying to see if I had enough to put it together. The reviewers did, still haven't told me if they think it's a load of crap. But whether if it's a load of crap or not, it's just the beginning. Another century of work by people who love music, who want to see it better understood theoretically. In visual art, um, I always loved uh, going to the Museum of Modern Art, the Metropolitan Museum I grew up in Queens was a short subway ride away from MoMA. I grew up with Monet and Matisse and Renoir, Picasso, all of them. Rooms full of it in the old building. And so later when I finally began to understand more about how our brains consciously see, I could think back, oh, in that painting by Matisse, I could begin to understand the aesthetic struggle he went through to make the painting work. And then I would read what Matisse wrote about his own struggle. Like he would write about seeing directly in color. Well, what the hell does that mean? But by the time I was ready, I knew just what he meant. And then I saw multiple impressionists and plein air painters in many different parts of the world were always trying to understand how we see directly in color. And to do, to explain what it meant, I had to use everything I knew about vision, how we see, otherwise I couldn't have done it. So, you know, again, it's the gift that keeps on giving. I never expected to say anything about music or paintings. And uh, you've also said a lot uh, about consciousness or at least what conscious states are. So that's a good seg into the, um, the idea of all conscious states are resonant states, but not all resonant states are conscious states. So could you elaborate on what distinguishes the resonances that do give rise to consciousness and the ones that don't? Well, by the time I had my 1980 psych review paper about art, um, I had understood <coughs> how art embodies processes of learning, expectation, attention, resonance, and synchrony. And I've 
already mentioned all of those. But then I also began to realize that in all of the representations of experiences that I was using those dynamics to explain, they, they seem to match parametric properties of conscious events. So I had sort of been dragged to consciousness through the back door, just the way I was dragged into mental disorders through the back door. It's the gift that keeps on giving if you work like a dog to get the, the foundations right. So consciousness, learning, expectation, attention, resonance, synchrony, I now call these the clears processes and theories like art embody the clears processes. Um, so I was able to say that all conscious states are resonant states way back then because of that. But it's not true that all resonant states are conscious states if only because the resonating hierarchy has to, I believe, include uh, processing stages whose cells encode features that represent either external qualia like color, uh, brightness, uh, sound, or internal quality like fear or relief. And you might say, well, why is it so that when you make recordings from cells whose parametric properties, at least as a pattern of cell responses, parametrically vary with psychophysical data about how we see color, why are we conscious of that? I think that's sort of the limit of what equations can tell you. I can't say why I see color. I might be able to say quite a bit about the underlying processes of how we consciously see and say when we see and even why. And as to why consciousness is there in the visual system, that has to do, I believe, with hierarchical resolution of uncertainty. So, you know, if you look down on your retina, you have a blind spot, you have retinal veins, you have a lot of uh, scattering of light through the, <coughs> through the eye and the lens. It's a very noisy, incomplete representation. And you need multiple processing stages <coughs> in order to discount the illuminant and do this and that and the other thing to generate sufficiently complete representations of boundaries and surfaces for you to be able to use them to control effective actions. Whereas if you'd used early and noisy and complete representations, <coughs> your behaviors would get you eaten. They wouldn't lead to uh, behavioral success. So I asked the question, well, what is the processing stage in vision, for example, where you have a complete enough surface representation to control effective looking and reaching. My prediction is it's area V4 and that there is a resonance between V4 and posterior parietal cortex, <coughs> which makes <coughs> the attended part of V4 <coughs> representation visible and that controls your reach and your looking behavior. And then I gave a lot of data that were compatible with it. And that's all I can do as to why those cells, first, they're not only doing that as soon as that resonance is triggered, the V4 representation is propagating top down all the way back to lateral geniculars at least, using the art matching rule to select uh, the uh, combinations of features that are compatible with that surface representation. And all the way up 
to prefrontal cortex. So the whole cortical stack is now synchronously resonating. And that's how you not only know how to reach, but you can say, oh, it's red because you're resonating with a representation that's representing features that are red. Do I completely understand it? No. But being able to say this has been a huge comfort and has helped me to explain a lot of data that I can't explain any other way. And that's all I can say. You know, it helped me make a beachhead into this profoundly challenging topic. And so, uh, on, what, what, you, what, what you said about hierarchical resonance um, seems to at least potentially um, create opportunities to link with global workspace theory and maybe even IIT, uh, inf integrated information theory. So what do you think about those, those approaches? They don't explain anything. And any theory of intelligence that's given by a scale of psi function, I mean, it's, I don't even know why people talk about it. I don't. And, and I've said this in public where he was talking. It wasn't, it wasn't politic and usually I like to be kind and supportive, but he made such outrageous claims in his lecture, which was before mine. And he explained absolutely no data that I, I couldn't let it stand, but he's still at it. You know, people uh, have no shame. <laughs> if they can get an audience and a grant, so it's a living. I don't view it as a living, I view it as a religious calling. So Steve, um, uh, so, yeah. since we've like gone into the higher uh, cognition and other topics, so this is something that you partially hinted in a very cute way in the very opening chapter of the book, uh, where you talk about how uh, you know, the different networks can be about democracy versus, uh, yeah. you know, uh, uh, oligarchy versus, you know, authoritarianism and so on. Uh, and I remember your your paper on uh, consensus and decision making in the 19, late 70s that you wrote about economics. So uh, my general question to you is like, um, this sort of a framework that you've developed this whole yeah, nonlinear system. Karthik, you know, I say it, <laughs> But I also found that it was fascinating that, you know, three of the main political systems uh, correspond to properties of a signal function. Of course, that's mm -hmm. not the whole story, but it's food for thought. And that's so, the way I offered it as a kind of, hmm, does this have any seriousness in it? Yes, sorry. So yeah, I mean, the question was, uh, it, uh, given those kinds of principles that you have established in, in that paper uh, from 1978 and this re elaboration with the recurrent competitive fields, um, uh, I know that most economists don't think about the economy in this dynamical manner. Uh, on the other hand, there is a rich, uh, there is something rich that can be born out of this way of modeling. So uh, do you see people uh, uh, taking up these ideas in economics and other fields uh, anytime soon, or are they going to go with their old uh, models? I know this is a slightly different weird off question from anything to do with the brain, but I think we are already on that topic. So, Well, so many approaches to, first, I'm not following everything that every mathematical economist says. I mean, Kahneman and Tversky got the Nobel Prize in economics for their work on decision-making under risk. And Bill Gutowski and I explained all their main data and why their uh, algebraic rules uh, are descriptive of their data as uh, a manifestation of very basic properties of cognitive emotional dynamics that have nothing to do with decision-making under risk. And that explanation, I would have hoped would have inspired a huge amount of work. Because here there's Nobel Prize winning work in economics and we explained 
you know, how it happens in our minds that we make these decisions, but it didn't. And the reason is the same reason why CNS was unique. You know, a lot of people aren't trained to have the intellectual uh, capital to model seriously in this way. And, and, but another thing, as I said, you got to find a phenomenon you love if you're going to put your heart and soul into it. So if someone loves this problem, maybe our contribution to that aspect might be useful. But a lot of the greatest people like von Neumann himself was a formalist and he got interested in economics and game theory, God knows, is brilliantly, uh, it's a beautiful thing. But then, you know, decades ago, people showed that in particular cognitive earthy among others, that humans don't make decisions in a game theoretical way. And did that stop people from wanting to study game theory? I, I don't know, I, I don't know. So, so you uh, know, from, if, from... If people are keeping interested and they don't hit a brick wall and they could build a life that's interesting, great. The problem is if you hit the brick wall when you're still young. And I've seen that with pure mathematicians, like when I was younger. Oh yeah, with log modular algebras, that's what it was. When I was younger, you know, guys would get so specialized. And you know, if you're the best of the best, then you can solve Fermat's last theorem. You will get, you know, the Fields Medal and even more. But if you're second and third best, don't go into pure mathematics, you know? I mean, it's that kind of thing. If there isn't a rich landscape of problems, why devote your life to it? Now, when I started, I felt like I was alone in this beautiful field filled with gorgeous flowers I could sniff and touch and no one else was there. It was just me and all the flowers. Now I've cultivated the field a little bit, but there's still a lot of a lot of wild flowers out there. So go for it. But you gotta decide which flowers you love. That's not for me to decide. It really isn't. So from from the body politic back to the body, uh, have you thought about um, uh, so you have some very interesting ideas about autism and schiz schizophrenia, and you can maybe elaborate a little bit here, but I was thinking of jumping straight to the idea that having studied it from your unique perspective, do you uh, even, uh, I guess you don't want to speculate, but do you think about the possibility of certain types of treatments that people haven't thought about yet? <clears throat> well, first, um, it depends who's listening. Like, I published a paper, I think in the 80s, about schizophrenia. I, I got into it through the back door uh, because I was understanding how under arousal and over arousal worked. And um, so, and, and you know, different mental disorders are at different extremes of the under arousal, over arousal continuum. Anyway, in that case, the leading um, research unit in America, I think it might have been in Maryland at that time, invited me to give a lecture on my work. And they liked it so much that I was invited to give the opening keynote lecture to the International Congress on Schizophrenia Research, maybe in 1989, 1999 all these decades sort of merge after a while. So someone was listening. Now, what they did with it later, I don't know, except I've read a number of articles recently that support my prediction about under arouse and over arouse symptomology. 
And I mentioned some of those articles in my book. Did they read my stuff? Probably not because, you know, experimental labs are often cliques in the best sense of the word. You know, when I grew up, you studied what your lab chief was interested in. And anything beyond that, you just didn't bother. And I had friends who knew I was explaining stuff that was related to what they were doing. They said, how the hell do you do that? And I tried to say, well, you know, it's also related to this and this, they didn't want to know. So it depends on the paradigm. If there aren't people who are in an environment where they can run with a certain discovery, it'll just lay there. But the fact is that some of my predictions got confirmed because that's what happens if it's correct. Okay, so is that helpful? I'm not sure. Yes, I don't I know think. if you read those parts, but as to the the Alzheimer's, I never dreamed I'd have anything to say about Alzheimer's. But when I began understanding how nucleus basal is cholinergic dynamics can get screwed up in terms of attention, learning, consciousness. And I started just doing searches for more and more data. There was a ton of data about schizophrenia and lots of experiments were showing problems with that system. And that's how I got into it. I already could see how those symptoms could arise from the model as it stood, if particular things went wrong in the cholinergic system. So whether people are gonna benefit from that, I can't predict that. If an uh, experimentalist came to me and said, you know, I'm really interested in that, I would talk with the experimentalist as I've done at multiple times in my life, but what are you able to do? For example, many years ago, Andreas Poli, who did his PhD with me, went to work with Emilio Bizzi. And I had done a lot of work on our movement. So I talked to Emilio about some of the modeling that Dan and I and others had done. Uh, and, and Emilio benefited from that. He didn't cite me. Same thing with Wolf Singer. He didn't cite me. And like with Wolf in particular, who I really love Wolf Singer, don't get me wrong. Um, Wolf, um, I said, you know, Wolf, after all these years, you know, I know I lectured, I gave lectures in his center and when he was still in Munich. Um, all these years I predicted all this stuff and so much of it has happened. You never mention me, you never cite me. And he said, and I can't confirm it, this was a long time ago. Well, whenever I put anything about your theoretical work in the discussion, that's the first thing the reviewers asked me to remove. So the world is not quite that bad to theorists today, especially since experimentalists learned that there were a lot of programs that you could only get a certain grant if you had a resident modeler in your lab. Um, but that didn't mean that that resident modeler was encouraged to learn the relevant modeling literature. The modeler was encouraged to model the data that would get them that grant. So politics. I think uh, it's been two and a half hours or so, so we should probably wrap up soon. Um, does anyone have any questions they'd like to uh, ask now? Not choices for uh, mostly stu grad students and students. First choice, if you want to ask yeah. a question. I, I could so, hear. I said the, the first choice for questions is for grad students and students rather than researchers, if you want to ask a question. I still didn't hear. I'm sorry. <laughs>
I'm not sure why I didn't hear. Well, if uh, if anyone could, uh, I, there was a, I was, I thought I would uh, end with this, but um, when I was looking at your 1964 uh, document, uh, I, I noticed that the, at the conclusion, something that kind of almost reminded me of Norbert Wiener's um, human use of human beings, where you talk about um, a rational understanding of human needs whose fulfillment is the proper aim of its unification and how there's, we have to be responsible researchers um, uh, and when and there's a line here where you say, when men study men, the reasons are familiar and the application is direct, it's kind of ominous. So compared to what you were talking about back then, uh, would you change anything about this? Or, or like, what are your warnings for researchers studying you know, human nature and stuff like that, uh, given the power that it could potentially unleash? Well, I tried to explain it a little bit in chapter 17, how, for example, people can hang on to false beliefs, even if they're disconfirming evidence, depending on the environment they live in, and that can lead them to do wicked things. But, but really, the, when you raised how I ended my 64 paper when I was 24, I had forgotten all about that. And what struck me so forcefully is I ended my new book in just about the same way. I'm an incurable optimist, unfortunately. Like I wrote it down, if I can read you this paragraph. This was in part what I wrote. Uh, this paper in 64 was written as a required first paper for all entering PhD students at Rockefeller University. Um, so it wasn't supposed to be published, but it became this humongous monograph. And then the faculty thought people should know about it. So they printed 125 copies and I sent it to all the most famous psychologists and neuroscientists in America who didn't know what the hell to do with it. One of them, at least, had the decency to write back, and that was Eric Kandel. So I wrote in part in that paper, this program contributes to a new program whereby quantitative methods can be used to integrate our knowledge of psychological, neurophysiological, and neuroatomical facts into a coherent intellectual system. The development of such a system is a natural reflection of the needs of the times for the unification of materialistic exchange and control processes that has so rapidly emerged in the past century must be balanced by a rational understanding of the human needs whose fulfillment is the proper aim of this unification. Such a balance is indeed a prerequisite to the establishment of a truly harmonious social order. And that's sort of how I ended my book. Um, the ending there was, the following quote has been attributed to Albert Einstein. It has become appallingly obvious that our technology has exceeded our humanity. In my own experience as a professor, scientist, and citizen, it's become clear that what we learn in school is predominantly about the external world and its many artifacts in our lives. One of these artifacts was the atomic bomb, which led Einstein to make his statement. Our the knowledge the external world is often used to develop new technologies without much consideration or knowledge about the minds that make these advances or about the minds that will be influenced by them, sometimes with tragic consequences. I believe that this imbalance needs to be corrected very soon before it leads to tragedies that may dwarf the atomic bomb. To this end, like think climate for starters, to this end, our educational and political systems could profit 
profitably incorporate much more understanding of how human minds work on the educational side, such knowledge can enrich several kinds of curricula. Anyway, the final short paragraph. Whether or not such large scale efforts are realized, I very much hope that books like the current one would make knowledge about how brains give rise to minds more broadly accessible. I also hope they'll encourage a process of knowledge diffusion through society until as in my 1964 statement, until the imbalance between our knowledge of technology and humanity is corrected so that our technological advances can take full account of who we are and our mental lives, as well as our physical lives can thereby be enriched. So I had forgotten all about it, but I guess the same thing's been on my mind since I was 24. So go figure. Um, and the, the challenges today are immense. So, you know, I hope enough smart people are going to do what can be done to slow down climate change and other tragedies. But some of the things I was thinking about here were how, you know, the radicalization of the far right in multiple countries is challenging what it means to have a civilized society. <coughs> right, so um, if there aren't any other questions, um, I think we can wrap up. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, this was great, very informative. And uh, I think it'll be very useful. I'll be putting this up on, on YouTube. And so anyone who sees this either now or on YouTube um, can ask me if you want to ask questions oh, or email well, Steve. And there are some tutorials I've put up. Uh, uh, I have some code in Python for some of the simpler um, Grossberg models also. Send me the URL. And so yes. Look when it's up. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for inviting me. And, and thanks to you for listening to the hopefully not too bitter end. <laughs> um, I never take for granted the privilege of people listening to what I have to say. And I'm very grateful. I was grateful for it when I was teaching some of you in school. I'm grateful for your interest to this day. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Stephen. And, uh, thanks, thanks to all the attendees and uh, see you hopefully at some point. Bye. Okay, cheers. <laughs>